Hi guys, Max of the Accidental Engineer. Uh, today we have the good fortune of having Ruby Bhattacharya join us. Uh, Ruby yes. is a senior technical recruiter with Coinbase. Uh, something like 15 years experience in the recruiting space. That's right, yeah. And uh, with r titles like Director of Recruiting, uh, worked with 500 Startups, the large incubator for startups. So a lot of experience with recruiting in the startup space. Uh, but today, uh, off the last uh, interview that we had, you mentioned uh, when you started in the engineering, or excuse me, in the recruiting mm. business, it was right after the dot-com bubble right. in like 2001 or 1999. Right. Right. Or... Yeah, 1999, <laughs> after, after the Y2K rubbish that happened, yeah. For sure. So yeah. I know that a lot of our audience is relatively younger, like if you were maybe in your mid-30s you might have encountered the dot-com mm. bubble, uh, but for people in their 20s today, they did not live right. through right. Uh, a big recession in the market for, in the job market for engineers in in the late 90s. Right. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a few questions about how the job market looked like from the perspective of a recruiter and maybe from the perspective of an engineer when employers were not eager to try and find people to work for you? So I would say what happened during that time period is um, business units were deciding what was the most critical positions to fill, what do we need minimally to make this product really good. And in order for us to do that, we are going to need the best people. We can't have average, we can't have you're okay, we need absolutely exceptional people to come in and take those positions and they'll normally be senior level positions. Um, a lot of time business groups will try and reorganize, obviously reorganize the, the group so people can get laid off due to that business, business units shut down and so on and so forth. So the types of roles that will be available will be high level jobs, experienced people with eight to ten years of experience who can who, who can manage that on their own and not need a huge support system to be able to, you know, move forward with that product. So among your group of friends at the time, uh, I guess, had you moved to the San Francisco Bay Area so at that point? So during yeah. the Y2K was in the UK, um, oh, yeah. and so I experienced what happened in the UK after that, that, what happened to the job market. When I came over here, it was 2005, so I believe there was, I we were just coming out of a, a dot-com recession. So, um, that's thing, five years. <laughs> yeah, that's five years. Um, so 2005 things started improving. The way you know things are improving is because companies start not only hiring salespeople, but they start hiring recruiters before they hire anyone else. Yeah. So, um, pe recruiters were being hired. Some of the major players in San Francisco at the time were people like Wells Fargo, Charles Schwab. These were people who you worked for typically, mm -hmm. you know, it was mostly financial in, the, in, uh, 2000. And, five. and then they started hiring like crazy. People started hiring like crazy again because the recession was lifting. Uh, we started hiring a huge amount. I was hiring a huge amount of developers, project managers, QA. So it was obviously people were starting to build stuff again and they had the money to be able to hire people. And then maybe three, four years later from 2005 was the financial crisis. Yes, so then it was good for a little bit. And then 2008 hit me as well as a lot of other people. So companies were laying off uh, engineers and uh, computer science folks left, right and center. Mm -hmm. And what it was left with, what the company would be left with was really strong, superior level engineers who mm -hmm. they knew would be able to you know, take the load, they could, re they could work minimally on their own without the support. And that's, that's how people got jobs. People, there was still a job market, people were still looking for things, but they tended to be very niche roles and they tended to be high skill level and with a lot of experience. And then those sorts of people ended up getting roles. So um, really what I would say is, try and have as much breadth of experience as possible and get that experience coming now because it, it you don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. You were telling me earlier that um, after the, the dot-com bubble burst, 
And uh, I guess after the financial crisis, the first jobs to come back, the first roles that recruiters were hiring for, whether in tech companies or elsewhere, were sales roles. Right. Do you mind sharing why that might be the case? Like, yeah. Why, it, why that it, happened? It, it seems like the most bizarre thing to do is to hire salespeople when you're starting off. But what, what has tended to happen with a lot of startups have the attitude that if we hire salespeople first, we'll sell the product, we get traction, then we build more of the product, and it's more like we have something minimal, we're going to sell it, and then we're going to build it after we've sold it and start customizing it for the customer. I'm not saying this is the best way to do things. I wouldn't necessarily recommend a CEO hire a bunch of salespeople. I'd much rather see a CEO hire a bunch of engineers first and make the product happen. And, and a lot of the time it's that Google attitude of it will sell itself. Um, the company I work for currently, um, I mean, we're bringing in like, you know, three million revenue a month. You mm -hmm. know, this, this, we haven't got any salespeople, so. Yeah. And we don't have any, any marketing. So at the end of the day, if the people are smart enough and they build a good enough product and you stay with focusing on how, not how sexy the company is, but what are they doing? What are they doing technologically wise? Are they at the forefront of the business? Um, do we need to work for trendy companies? What technologies are these technologies companies using? They may not be they're using the best. But if you want to, if you want to really nail it down, you start going for the companies that are using the latest technologies in an innovative space that no one else is dealing with. That's a very advisable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Very, very different business models. Like, uh, I know that it's common. There's kind of a spectrum of how many or what proportion of employees are in engineering versus sales, and that's maybe. Uh, that's generally a pretty public number about employers, but as engineers who are job searching, uh, is there any kind of takeaway that they can make or judgment they can make yeah, about a company? Yeah, definitely. On... So there's someone I'm trying to recruit currently who uh, is working for an organization that has ended up being a sales heavy organization. It's a sales company, right? Yeah. That That's <laughs> what she's working for. So what she has noticed at working at a sales company is that if they have that as the focus, engineering t kind of takes a back seat. So therefore, they don't get to use the latest technologies. They're just keeping things running as a, as a basic minimum. They're not gonna be innovative. They're not gonna have the projects that are juicy because they've got the people behind it and they're often using people instead of technology to do the job. So, and so manual work versus automation. Manual work versus automation. Now, a company can choose to do that. They can choose to like have people doing some stuff that it would take a group of engineers, you know, a bit to figure out how to automate all these processes. But the fact that they're not automating it, you know, means you're not going to get into these juicy problems. Yeah. It means you're supporting a sales organization. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working for an organization that's sales heavy, but it's a question to ask, uh, how many salespeople do you have? How many engineers do you have? And then you can cut and then you can get a sense. Because if I was to tell you, like, we've got 50 engineers and 110 people and no salespeople, yeah. you see, it kind of, it makes kind sense. of makes a difference, you know, between another company saying, oh yeah, it's 50-50 or we've mostly got salespeople. So in the recruiting process, in our last interview, you briefly mentioned about the 360 oh, yeah. recruiting process. So uh, for those people who don't know what the 360 recruiting process is uh, or what that entails about the process by which employers find employees, do you mind kind of yeah. sharing what okay, that means? Okay, so that's more like a, um, it's really more a recruiting term than anything else. Okay. 360 recruiting means that you got one point of contact right from the beginning. So the person who reached out to you or you applied to starts working with you through the process. Um, they take, they just try and prep you, uh, take you through each interview or sync up with you uh, during that time. Then if you get the job, they'll make the offer close it out, give you the offer. So they're involved for the whole process and they will organize, facilitate everything that needs to happen mm -hmm. in order for you to get the job. So that's really what free, so you just get one person. And in bigger companies, you don't always get one person. It can be a couple of people <laughs> who you're gonna be going to. And I wouldn't worry about that. It just means that organization is being very efficient at 
finding more candidates, finding more suitable people. We're able to talk to more people and that's what, what that means. So it's nothing to worry about when you've been handed it off from one person to a different person. Yeah. It's actually so, a, it's actually a good thing because you'll be handed over to a recruiter who will be your advocate throughout that whole process. In contrast to having a phone screen with Ruby and then right. another screen with Max, yep. and then uh, on-site with Joey, and then another on-site with Sally. And then me <laughs> coming in every time to check in how you're doing, and then we have the salary discussion, and then hopefully you get an offer, and then I work with a, a management to come up with a comp package, and then I will give it. At the moment, what I'm doing is mainly going from Dealing once the person has deemed uh, technically competent and mm -hmm. they're they're good at what they do, I take them from there and put them through the process. I think the scariest aspect for a lot of engineers in applying for jobs and going through the 360 recruiting process is dealing with a technical screen or a skills test, and the best engineers may be less fearful of that step, but I think everyone has apprehensions about what get, what might get asked of them. So one of the things I'm curious about, and I think our audience is curious about, is how skill tests or technical screens might have changed from post.com, post-financial crisis to now. Like are, are there, is there a more of an emphasis on technical screens these days or uh, are the nature of questions or the amount of time that uh, the recruiting process focuses on skills tests changing? I would say that depends from company to company. There's one company I know that takes three months to hire people. Wow. That's the way they want to do it. <laughs> and if you want to, if you're okay with that, that's great. But there's other people who want to get through it dead quick. So it'll happen in a week. It depends on the company. Um, for example, um, with Coinbase, what we do, it, it has a very high technical bar, mm -hmm. so we do need to incorporate a huge amount of coding and architecture challenges to make sure that this person has the adequate amount of knowledge to be able to work on the products that we're asking them to work on. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is the first tech screen will be, tends to be an hour. This ch differs from company to company, of obviously, but course. it will be around this kind of process. You get the Google Google Hangout text screen and don't worry about these things. Best thing to do, don't try and pick a language that you don't know or you're not sure about or you, you just want to impress someone with. Use the language you know really, really well, then do the exercise. Because the whole point of that is to see how you're thinking and how you logically go through a problem. That's what they're looking for, not necessarily how many stages of this interview you got through. Yeah. Um, Te yeah, and then further on from that, like there's further technical, you come on site and you do a further on site coding challenge with, uh, with an engineer. Mm -hmm. You do a further on site challenge with an engineer on architecture. Okay, and then you have a take home exercise, which is a challenge that you have to do. You have to do all of these things before you're even going to be coming in for your last interview. Um, which tends to be with the, our company tends to be a panel interview, uh, sorry, a pair programming interview where you come in for the whole day, you paired up with two people from the team, you get to meet the team, um, you get to meet management, senior leadership as well, and then after that point we make the offer. But you can see along each stage of the way, technical coding, coding, it's it part of every single interview that we do. So I don't know if every single company does that. I don't think so necessarily, mm -hmm. yeah. but I think when you have a very innovative company with a high engineering bar, expect that that's what's going to happen and don't be you know, too worried about it. I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, applicants for engineering roles are apprehensive about skills tests is the time investment in comparison to a conversational screening call. Um, I know that one signal, one big tip to job seekers and people going through these application processes is that you should definitely feel free to judge and vet employers by whether you have a partner uh, on the inside while you do these assessments um, because it's a very strong signal that that employer cares about seeing how you're thinking but also that they have skin in the game and that they're paying a cost in having a, an employee sit with an interviewee, a prospective candidate, through your skills test. That is a huge signal. 
in contrast to uh, the kind of take home problems that I think a lot of people get turned off by. And there's a reason you guys get turned off by this and I, 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 we both get it. Um, so that's, a, that's something I think changes depending on the job market and depending on how overwhelmed an employer is with 